The election is fast approaching, and people are wondering about the various tax policies being proposed by Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump as we approach Election Day. And here to talk with me about these various tax proposals are Bob Keebler from Keebler & Associates and Steve Siegel. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Pleasure to have you here. Uh, we're going to sort of roll through the various proposals uh, by topic. Uh, first, I want to tackle individual income taxes. <clears throat> Vice President Harris has uh, proposed um, some things, and this is a bit of a moving target, I'll admit. It seems like things are changing day to day as people are trying to navigate what might uh, hit home with, t uh, with voters. Uh, under the Harris plan, and such as we know it today, there are, I'll go through the bullet points, exempt tip income from taxation, expand the child tax credit to $6,000, expand the earned income tax credit for filers who do not claim children, expand premium tax credits, expand housing tax credits. And uh, according to Kiplinger's, uh, she'd, bring back <coughs> she'd bring back the top 39.6% uh, income tax rate for people making $400,000 or more and hike the 3.8% net investment income tax surtax to 5% for these taxpayers. And she also backs a 25% minimum income tax on the ultra-rich, people with at least $100 million in wealth. By contrast, uh, former President Donald Trump has said that he would make the expiring individual income tax cuts from the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, permanent. He would consider replacing personal income taxes with increased tariffs. He would consider expanding the child tax credit to $5,000, and that he, too, would exempt tips from income taxes. Uh, gentlemen, thoughts, reactions, advice? Well, what I would just start by saying, and I'm sure uh, everyone listening is, would be in agreement, that nothing either of them is going to propose will happen unless they, both ha they all have a majority in the Congress, because some of these plans are so diverse between one side, one party and the other, that one party would not agree to what the other would suggest unless there's compromise. And Tip O'Neill is no longer with us, so compromise has not happened in a while. So that that's where I would just start, just thinking about that. And the only other comment I would make is that uh, this, along with other things we're going to talk about, the wealthier clients that we all represent uh, are going to be paying a whole lot more tax uh, on one of these plans than the other. And so planning should begin soon if the election all goes in one direction. All right. Bob, thoughts? I would agree with that. I would say for anyone that's over that $100 million, you need to initiate a discussion with your CPA and your lawyer, like immediately, to see if there's any chess moves available. The move from 37 to 39.6, the best move for the mass affluent on that will be to evaluate Roth conversions, whether there's any efficacy to that in your particular situation, whether that fits you know, for your family. The change of the 3.8% tax to 5%, obviously over time it's a big thing, but there's not a lot we can do to plan for that other than working on accelerating income into 2024 and in all likelihood 2025. Now, it's possible these would have retroactive effect, but more likely these the things we're discussing here would be effective 1126. But again, it is possible they would have retroactive effect to 1125. So we just want to be cognizant of that. One other thought would be if if one side wins everything and can pass a law sooner than the end of 25, that's at least in the realm of possibility. Not probability right now, but possibility. But we'll have to see. But certainly, if Congress is all on one side of the aisle and they have enough votes, they don't have to wait for 1126 to change everything. That seems to be the target date. Congress usually figures out tax, tax laws sometime around October, and then they pass them in November or December for the next year. But as Bob said, there is the possibility that some things could be made retroactive, which uh, obviously suggests that we don't 
allow clients to wait and see what's going to happen for very long. So the planning horizon, it seems, would be from Election Day through the end of 2024 for for some folks to take action, assuming that I'm guessing Pres Vice President Harris wins and then controls the Senate and the House. But there's not enough time during that short window with Thanksgiving plus the other plus Hanukkah and Christmas, things aren't going to get done. Right. And you know, you got to call your appraisers, your lawyers, your CPAs and get them get get the appointment now. Don't wait till day after the election to call. You won't get your call returned till next year, most likely. Bottom line is act now and don't wait. Don't procrastinate. Right. I think you have to initiate your your discussion with your, especially with the CPAs, because there's a true shortage of CPAs. And it's going to show up when there's this urgency that all of a sudden happens after the election. Agree. All right. So that covers, I think, individual income taxes. There's also some proposals around capital gains and dividend taxes. Um, according to the Tax Foundation, no tax policies have been proposed by former President Donald Trump. But on the Vice President Harris side, we see that uh, she's proposed a 28 percent tax rate on long term capital gains for households earning a million dollars or more annually, uh, which is a significant increase from the current maximum rate of 20 percent. Um, according to The Wall Street Journal today, they wrote that the 28 percent rate that she's talking about is misleading since she also backs a five percentage point surcharge on investment income, which we discussed, and that her plan would raise the top capital gains tax rate on taxpayer, taxpayers making more than one million dollars to 33 percent from 23.8 percent. Uh, thoughts, reactions to that? Big change. And the most important thing is, you know, over time, there's not going to be a lot you can do about this. We have the the normal techniques we use to manage capital gains. But in the next four months, there's very important things to think about. For example, if someone was going to sell their business to their children anyway, they might want to sell in 2024 rather than waiting. Because the delta there is obviously 33 minus 23.8. And so you're saving nine, 10 points. And if I was going to sell my business to my children anyway, why wouldn't I just sell today and uh, pay the tax at that lower rate? So I think also if somebody's in the process of selling their business and they're negotiating, they should keep in the back of their mind the urgency of maybe trying to close the deal before December. I don't disagree with any of that. The certainly the higher rates are scary uh, for people with uh, highly appreciated assets. Uh, they may want to lock in their gains sooner rather than later if it looks like it's going to uh, this might pass. One other thought might be try to play a game with installment sales. If you create an installment sale in 24 and with installments going forward, you don't have to file your tax return till April or October of 25. You are allowed to elect out of the installment sale and pay all the tax for the year you did the sale. So if you sell in 24, if the law gets worse, the rates go higher going forward, then lock in your gain in 24. If that doesn't happen and you have divided government and it looks like we're going to stay where we are now, then let the installments work themselves through. Just another way to you know, the whole point, I think, a lot of this is since we don't know what's going to happen, where are all the places we can hedge? Where are all the places we can kind of be on the, you know, the edge of the cliff without jumping off, but jump off when necessary or when appropriate? There was a, another uh, item that was mentioned by the Tax Foundation, which is that taxpayers with net worth above $100 million, that they would pay a minimum tax on their unrealized capital gains from assets such as stocks, bonds, or privately held companies, uh, which is something that, I, to my recollection, has never been done in this country before. That's true. There's big issues with that. If you look at the Moore case, the U.S. Supreme Court is setting up this issue of whether you can have unrealized capital gains. And this would certainly be litigated, but I think any family that finds themselves in that situation should be working 
with their advisors in the next four months to, to see what can we do. And there's there's been legislation proposed in the past that lays out the statutory construction there. The Green Book gives us a blueprint of where things might go. So we're, we're starting to see enough of how this tax would work that we may be able to develop some planning. Yeah, Senator Wyden in Oregon has the, been the, one of the leaders in proposing this tax. And one concern one can raise is if it does get through, then the question is how much revenue will they raise from those persons over the $100 million? And as the government decides on more spending, perhaps, they'll decide to lower that threshold. Once they have that foot in the door, so to speak, there's nothing that says if it's legal— to tax unrealized gains, why not make the threshold 50 million or 75 million or 20 million? That's again, that's a concern that isn't on the table now, but it's just something long range we should be getting clients to be aware of. And it seems like this is an issue where the devil is in the details. Is it uh, will I pay an annual annual tax on my unrealized gains or is it just a one time tax or? Is it calculated uh, sort of sequentially? Uh, it, it seems like a, a, a an accountant's uh, nightmare. <laughs> what happens when the gains become losses? You know, the NVIDIA goes up and down. What happens on the up you pay and the down do you get a refund? Who knows? It doesn't appear like that, Steve, and that's what they'll have to wrestle Now, there's a close cousin to this that's being proposed, and that would be for anyone with over $10 million in IRAs they would have to take some of the money out and bring their balance back down to 10 million. And that is something if any of your listeners are in that situation, they should really be talking to someone now about what to do because for my clients in that situation, if we see that coming, we'll be doing Roth conversions, paying the taxes from inside the IRA and trying to bring the IRA under that threshold. I mean, that's that's sound advice. The, uh, the the Roth is the one way to solve some of this. I did see something, some proposal that I don't know if it was in the Biden Green Book or Senator Wyden's plan that would limit the ability of people with income over certain levels to do Roth conversions. The four hundred thousand dollar level, Steve, that's single I'm 450 married, I think they said. That's why for many people that window may be from the day after the election through the end of the year. Now, I think that's that's something that all the accountants and all the attorneys should be telling their clients, because if that window closes, they're going to be very upset because that's a major planning opportunity that will be taken away, perhaps, early next year or at the end of this year. I want to move on to payroll taxes. Uh, according to the Tax Foundation, uh, Vice President Harris has not... <clears throat> Um, mentioned anything around payroll taxes, but former President Donald Trump has mentioned that he would like to exempt Social Security benefits from taxation. Uh, I, I have my thoughts, but I'm eager to hear yours first. How they're going to make that work is difficult. Uh, people who paid into the system and couldn't deduct their payments and now are receiving money from the system and are paying tax on it would probably be pleased to say, I'm getting back my money. But if we do all the math and all the arithmetic, you're probably getting a little bit more than the money you paid in. Maybe with inflation adjustments, uh, it's coming close to being what you paid in. I've seen some studies that say you're not getting back what you paid in. So it's, it's, all, it's all not entirely clear. I don't think there's a lot of planning around this other than if that comes to fruition, there's formulas predicated upon your income. So what people would want to do is they would push income into the year that that, ex that, that first cut becomes law because then less of their Social Security benefits in the current year, say 2025, you might be able to reduce how your Social Security benefits are taxed in 2025, and then in 2026 they'd be exempt. So that will be planning that financial planners across the country will be working with their clients on. I think the statistics indicate that the majority of Social Security recipients are not paying taxes on their Social Security benefits because, what is it, 25,000 single, 35,000 married, 
that's exempt. And then over that, you start paying. So, again, for, for our clients, I would think they would be very interested in this. But for the majority of America, they're not paying this anyway. So not sure where this is going to go. To me, it's like pulling a piece of uh, thread on a sweater where uh, part of the money, at least to my understanding, uh, that the uh, that the tax on these Social Security benefits is used to fund Medicare, which then would mean that money to fund Medicare would have to come from somewhere else. Right. So I want to turn to um, what I think might be your favorite topic uh, of late, Bob, is the estate and wealth tax uh, issue um, on the on former President Trump's side. According to the Tax Foundation, he would make the expiring estate tax cuts from the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act permanent on Vice President Kamala Harris's side. Uh, still to be determined, but um, she's made reference to uh, uh, to a a uh, an act filed by Senator Warren called the American Housing and Economic Mobility Act of 2024. And you're in a much better position to explain what this is and the implications, Bob. Vice President Harris would like to build three and a half million new homes. And to pay for that, the bill introduced by Senator Warren would largely look to the estate tax. What they would do would be to cut the estate tax exemption from currently roughly $13,610,000 down to three and a half million dollars. They would also raise the rates. But more importantly, for very wealthy people, right now, Steve and I have a very robust toolbox of strategies we can use. And virtually all those strategies would be taken away. So there's, there's four things that we do. We try to freeze the value of people's estates. We try to lock in valuation discounts. We have our clients pay their the income taxes for their trusts out of their own pocket, not out of the trust pocket. And finally, we set up trusts that go three, four, five generations or longer. Virtually every one of those planning ideas would be taken away from us under the bill proposed by Senator Warren. Now, these are not unique ideas. Senator Wyden has proposed these in the past. President Biden's Green Book would get to the same point. So, we know that there's only there's a limited list of things they can do, and they're very focused in on the best techniques we have available to us right now. It's almost like the uh, people proposing these things have listened to all of our lectures and read our articles over the last 10 or 15 years and then said, how can we defeat everything they're recommending? Senator Biden's bill is called the GRAT bill, Get Rid of Abuse of Trusts. And so there's a strong position here. I think I, everything Bob said I agree with. We have a limited time to do the slats and the grats and the idgits and the cuprits and all the, all the planning techniques that we've been ha used. When I've talked about this, I've said that for the last 30 years since 1990 when grats became law and, and beyond, we've had the golden age of trust and estate planning. We've been able to save clients thousands, hundreds of thousands, wealthiest clients, millions of dollars. That may all go away if this laws, if these laws pass. Everything that Bob said, that they're going to take away virtually everything. The GST stretch outs, the, the grant delays, the, uh, the intentionally defective trust, grantor trust will no longer be favorable. All these things are on the chopping block, one may, might say. And it will take a majority of Congress and the White House to pass all this, but it's certainly out there. So my understanding is, I think it's Form 706 that uh, that one has to file if your estate is above the uh, $13 million and what, right? And so right now my estimation is, and, and you can verify this, it, uh, roughly about 4,000 of those were filed in the previous year. But it sounds like if these measures were to be introduced, maybe tens of thousands of people might have to soon file the 706. Yeah, if you think about it right now, as Bob said, 13610000 is this year's exclusion. A married couple can double that to over $27 million and have no tax to pay. If this went to $3.5 million, married couple $7 million with no tax to pay. That's an enormous change. And, and think of the clients who today 
have a life insurance policy with a million dollars or so, a home that might be worth near a million dollars, and a brokerage account and some savings, they might be around three and a half million. Today, they have no concern about the federal estate tax. Well, that could change very quickly if they make it three and a half million. Those not so modest, but those assets that many people can have will suddenly make you a taxpayer. And like you said, Bob, the, there'll be a lot more 706s filed. Maybe accountants will be happy about that. They'll get all that work back. So the, the planning opportunity here is, once again, to call your CPA, your estate planning attorney, and start the ball rolling uh, in the event that there's a regime change? Absolutely. Absolutely. And just one other thought along that line, that you know, most of us, my clients, I'm sure many other people's clients, when you say to them, if you've exceeded your gift exclusion, you can pay gift tax, and as long as you don't die within three years, you're ahead of the game economically. Getting them to make that payment is not easy. Explaining it is easy. Getting them to make it is very difficult. But this might be another opportunity for your wealthiest clients who've used their full exclusion, who are healthy, not likely to die within three years, to make a significant additional gift while the tax rate is 40 percent, because if it goes up to 55, they're not going to be happy. So we've covered a lot of ground. Anything we missed or anything that bears reemphasizing? The only thing I would say is the urgency of planning should not be ignored. No, no, that's it. Ur- urgency is the operative word. To me, this is a bit of a moving target. Um, the, the proposals are changing. Different ideas are being tossed about. Uh, it's we're not on. These are not set in concrete per se, right? In terms of what will what is being said may not be what will be done. True. True. True enough. We'll have to see what happens, but uh, a lot of uh, a lot of interesting times ahead. Well, I guess we're cursed to live in interesting times. <laughs> so, gentlemen, Steve, Bob, I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us and our viewers, and uh, it, I'm sure it'll be so greatly appreciated. So, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for having us. Thank you.